So I'm in northern Idaho and a funny thing happens. I post a picture of a baby buggy, a Hyundai, thinking you guys would be interested in a Hyundai. Do I get any questions about a Hyundai? Instead, goose egg, zip, zilch, nada, nothing. I don't even get questions about a Chevy, Ford, or Toyota. Instead, all the questions are about a certain large baby buggy from a neighbor in South Korea. So for the first time ever, I gotta set some ground rules on this episode. We first gotta drive the Hyundai. We first gotta understand the Hyundai. Then maybe, just maybe, we'll start talking about how it compares to skiing in the Colorado Rockies. you look at that stunning northern Idaho with a beautiful straight in the middle of what looks to be God-given trees. Uh, we got, what, a little over 4,100 pounds. This one's more like 4,400 north of that. Let's dig deep because there's something really interesting going on here besides horsepower and torque, and that is this engine switches between Atkinson and AutoCycle. But you're asking yourself, why the hell is this important? Well, it's important for a couple of reasons. Atkinson, you're thinking, well, isn't that on a Prius or a hybrid, is that kind of stuff? Yeah, and the entire purpose of that is it, it delays the intake cycle to increase the efficiency. Okay, so why in practice would this be important? Well, scenarios like this, where I'm not looking for a lot of load, the Hyundai engineers have programmed the brain to talk to the engine to say, run an Atkinson cycle so we can take advantage of some efficiency even in a large vehicle like this. But then the flip side of that real world example, Hyundai has taken into account that there are people like me or sometimes you really need to get the Rugrats to school faster, then the brain can be programmed to go over to the auto cycle, which is more conventional, what you see in cars that you and I, car guys and gals drive, and there is acceleration. There is more on-demand power. Right? I'm going a bit too fast, I want to meet the local constable. Technical mumbo jumbo aside, what's the net net of this? On paper, it sounds kind of like a gimmick, but the reality is you get kind of the best of both worlds. Does it result in great fuel economy? You would have had to live under a rock for the past couple of years to not notice a ubiquitous design theme that's gotten very popular with OEMs around the world. The concept is simple. You take one design, but you make it in three different sizes, small, medium, and large. It's called nesting dolls. It was invented by Russians, and as of late, it's very popular with German manufacturers. Here, it's a bit of a different direction in that we've seen the small, the Kona, the medium, the Santa Fe, and now the large, the Palisade, and while you wouldn't accuse Hyundai of making these things look alike. There are cues that carry through both outside, like the headlights, and inside. Remember the console we saw on the Nexo? Well, that's made its way now to the Palisade. On the other side of the hill with the elevation change going in the opposite direction, great opportunity to discuss the steering. Not something usually the bastion of these types of vehicles. And there's really no nice way to say this, vague on center field. When you push a bit more aggressively, there is some feedback, but not a whole hell of a lot. Is that going to be a huge problem for this thing's mission and the people who are most likely going to buy this thing? I think not. So Caesar and I are well aware of the raging debate between those that think they're purists that say, oh, I'd never have a sunroof in my car because I don't want to disturb the structural rigidity. And then those that are like us that really like open top cars, but are also car purists. Um, and we're not going to bore you in this episode with the usual yada yada yada, high strength steel, yada yada yada, Hyundai's a steel company masquerading as a car company. Rather, uh, they seem to have listened to Caesar and I in that it's not just the content of high strength steel that is up in the Palisade, it's where they put it and also how they make it. So they've put more high strength steel and it's formed differently around the sunroof opening. So as a basis of comparison, it now it's 59% high strength steel, the total vehicle, but where the car is replacing the Santa Fe Excel, uh, it had a 6.2% reduction in structural rigidity with a sunroof. The Palisade is a 1.5% reduction in structural rigidity. So as you can see, that gets um, old Caesar very excited here. 
Some of you may have heard the exciting news that I am now on the jury panel of the World Car Awards organization, so one of my first orders of business was to rope in a fellow juror, the lovely and gracious Scotty Reese, to drive for us so you and I can experience ride quality from the vantage point where most people in these things would experience it. So Scotty, would you be kind enough to drive very aggressively around this turn here? And I know we should not be trying this at home, but Scotty's a professional. Uh, some test notes. Number one, there's some imperfections in the road, kind of like this, elevation changes, and the big thing you notice is really nothing. It's a big vehicle. That's what the wheelbase is uh, paying dividends on, is the ride quality. But as Scotty really pushes it hard around this turn here, we're going to hold on for dear life. Santa Maria, Madre de Dios. And the big takeaway from this little experiment, your occupants, they're not going to be impacted so much by pitch, squat, dive, and roll. I would go so far as to saying it was tuned more as a luxury car than a family car from a Korean car company. The U.S. government calls this thing midsize, but you and I both know it's really a large, three-row, front-wheel drive crossover. Knowing that, an important word about its competition. Only up until a couple of years ago, like two, this entire segment was dominated by large three-row front-wheel drive crossovers. There was like a black sheep of this segment kind of off to the side that had a lot of seats and was rear-wheel drive. Problem was, it wasn't seriously competitive in all the huge points like fuel economy and packaging. However, fast forward to 2019, and now the number of rear-wheel drive offerings has now doubled. But more importantly, that new offering is far more competitive in this segment. So we got to look at this really in two ways. Number one, is this hope or is it progress? And number two, does rear wheel drive move the needle in a segment that's really a function of moving a lot of people and trying to get as much efficiency while doing it? This is where I, a six-footer, would sit, and clearly no impact, uh, even can cross my legs. Uh, there's a couple adjustments back here. I can move this forward backward, and then, of course, I can move the seat back like this, the seat back. Then there's the armrest, fancy-dancy armrest stuff here. Uh, now, a note about this. This uh, limited model, which means it has that second sunroof in the back as well as a bunch of other stuff, uh, can also be fitted with a bench seat, which means it's eight seats. This one's seven. Now, obviously, this one is far more attractive, uh, but that opens up the door to the power. Now, you can see I'm kind of multitasking. I'm charging the battery for that camera there, as well as my phone. Turns out there is one USB port for every passenger in this specific vehicle we're in right now. And then, now, have I told you I got a little bit of OCD, so I like things in their proper places? Well, there are map pockets here, uh, but you wouldn't want to take your fancy-dancy phone and put it in the map pocket and, like, scrunch it down with other stuff. So there's, like, a net here in which to store the phone while it's being charged here. Probably my favorite design feature I've seen on this thing, full stop. Uh, then there's a lot of sun chains up here, front sunroof over here. Uh, diamond stitch, not exactly the same as the car, which we will talk about towards the end of this episode. And then, have I told you about Trevor? Trevor, he's the product manager for SUVs at uh, Hyundai. And he's like the king of dad jokes. Well, once we got through our litany of dad jokes, he told me, you wait till you see the cup holders. And I'm like, have you met me, cup holders? So I got in this thing and I'm looking around and I start counting the cup holders. There are 16. Yes, it is indeed that time again to play your favorite game in mind, the options game with today's contestant. Not that. Rather, the 2020 Hyundai Palisade Limited all-wheel drive 
Two programming notes before we dive in here. Number one, this is the first ever round of the game we're playing in the Great White North. And number two, this is the first time we are joined in the game by Kumo's Canadian cousin, Kaiser, otherwise known as Caesar. Now, knowing that, let's dive into the manufacturer's suggested retail price of $46,400. To that, we add carpeted floor mats that cost extra on an almost $47,000 car, $160. To that, we add inland freight and delivery for $1,045 for a total price of $47,605. Now, you could be about as excited as he is right now, thinking that it's just like that Volkswagen Arteon episode and that this car has no options, or you could realize that I'm sandbagging you here because we started with the one that has completely everything in it and then some. In reality, there are two other models on offer. There's like a bargain basement one, 31,000, that's $550. And then there is an SEL, call it the Goldilocks middle of the road model. That one is $33,500. Those can be fitted with individual options, kind of like a single sunroof, $900. Premium package, $2,400. And then there is a limited model that's front wheel drive, $44,700. All of them can be had with all wheel drive for $1,700. Or you could go right the way I did to $47,605 and have everything in it. So um, Hyundai calls this their flagship. Kind of an oxymoron to me when you can say Hyundai and flagship in the same sentence, but is that too much, too little, just right? Let us know in the comments below, or you can hit us up, hey, me, both me and Caesar, at our social Moto Man TV on Word, Moto Man TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please, when you're talking pricing, please be reasonable. So let's recap, shall we? It's practical. You're going to put your family in it and it's sort of utility. In that case, let's prep for the mission. Please do not try this at home. Hands on the wheel, nobody behind us. Okay, definitely worked, but notice there was a little pull from side to side in a panic stop simulation. But I would argue we learned something far different here, more about the suspension than the brakes and how the engineers set it up. See how much dive there was? It set up more, someone to put it softly sprung, than something this size from Germany. Okay, so we know how much it costs, we know how it drives, and we know it's pretty flash on the inside. So let's dispense with the pleasantries and focus on the elephant in the room. What the hell is the difference between this and a certain ski town in the great state of Colorado? Now to answer that, I could tell you all about power folding seats and 12 inch TFT screens that have fancy new graphics and whiz bang apps that are indeed very cool, but you don't come to me for regurgitating press releases now, do you? So you damn well better believe I roped in our old friend, Mike O'Brien, who's a pilot, a proper car guy, and just happens to run all of product at Hyundai. And he gave me the real deal. It turns out it's not just design, or even tuning of the suspension that's different. It's actual components that are underneath the vehicle that are different, pretty significant components, the shocks themselves. So if you look at the Kia Telluride, the shocks are supplied by a Korean company called Mando. In the case of the Hyundai, the shocks are supplied by a German company called Saks, which is part of ZF, yes, that ZF. Now, not to get too technical here, but those Saks shocks, try to say that fast three times, they're a bit of a different design. They're called preloaded. It's a derivation of a monotube. And the main difference here is the valve can open and close faster. What does that mean for us out in the real world? Well, it changes the way the vehicle drives. Overall, a Palisade drives a bit softer than a Kia Telluride. However, even though it's softer, there's more composure on real world roads and there's significantly more lateral control. So less lean side to side. So let me put this another way. Remember in the Kia Telluride episode, I told you that that was the nicest Ford Flex that I have ever driven. Meaning it looks like an SUV, but it really drives like a car. This, it drives more like a crossover an SUV. Now that we all understand each other, there's one side note that relates back to the options game. You see, if one wants a Hyundai Palisade fitted with an auto leveling system, that changes the rear shocks 
to the Mando shocks. So yes, technically the same supplier, however, those shocks in the Hyundai are tuned to match the Saks shocks in the front on the Hyundai. So while they are technically the same supplier as the Kia, they are not tuned the same as the Kia. Verstehen Sie das? And with that, I've saved maybe not the best for last, depending how you look at it, in an otherwise incredibly impressive car. And that would be both a design as well as a functional difference between this and the Kia Telluride. The push button shifter. There's no nice way for me to say this. I just don't like these. I don't like them in classic 50s and 60s cars. I don't like them in cars today. I get the logic. It opens up the designer to have more space with the console to make it more functional for the kind of people that buy these things. But call me a crotchety British car fan. I just, I want me an old school shifter in here and that's what the Kia has. This doesn't. So I'll leave this part open to interpretation to you guys. Until I see you next time, bis später.